Recorded Books presents What Happens in the Ballroom by Sabrina Jeffries. Narrated by Beverly A. Crick. Chapter 1 London, April 1812. Nathaniel Stanton, the Earl of Foxstead, stopped short, arrested by the sight of Mrs. Eliza Pierce headed toward him. How could he have forgotten how beautiful the widow was? It had scarcely been a year since they'd seen each other, and even then, only briefly, while surrounded by friends and family. Yet still she took his breath away. Tonight, in that satin evening gown, skimming her full form, with the squared bodice showing so much of her bosom, she looked as ravishing as a practiced courtesan but with no heavy paint to mar her features. Her golden curls were caught up in a sort of band about her head, leaving one long tress to trail down her neck onto her nearly bared shoulder. He fancied that if he tugged that single curl, the rest would come tumbling down to her waist. God help him, it had been too long since he'd had a woman. Unfortunately, this woman, of all women, would be the wrong one, since she already thought him a raging rake hell. Which made sense, given he'd been one for years before the war. Lord Foxstead, I'm surprised to see you here. Eliza smiled as she reached him, then held out her gloved hand. I would never have taken you for a lover of amateur musical performances. He took her hand. Yet here I am, Mrs. Pierce. She nodded in her usual serene fashion. It's good of you to come. I couldn't persuade your friend the Duke to do so. <laughs> of course not. Nathaniel squeezed her hand as firmly as he dared before releasing it. Now that he has married your sister, he only sticks his nose out the door for his engineering projects. <laughs> True. Her gay laugh poked at a part of him long hidden from the world, and from himself. So did her eyes, which matched the blue of her gown so perfectly that he knew the fabric had been chosen for that purpose. His face must have shown his distraction, for his own sister cleared her throat. Forgive me, Mrs. Pierce, he told Eliza, but may I introduce my sister, Lady Teresa Osborne? Tess has come to London for the season. Tess offered Eliza her hand. It's lovely to meet you. Eliza pressed Tess's hand. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. Then she broadened her gaze to include him. And please accept my condolences on the death of your mother last autumn. I should have sent a note. When she trailed off, he said... I'm sure you've had plenty to worry about yourself, especially with your sister's wedding. I hated to miss it. You were both still in mourning. It just ended, his sister said softly. Tess disliked any discussions of death. He couldn't exactly blame her since they'd lost both their parents in the past three years. So he wasn't surprised when she changed the subject. I understand that you'll be performing this evening, Mrs. Pierce. Do call me Eliza, please. She lifted an eyebrow at Nathaniel. Your brother always does. But yes, I'll be playing and singing. Both? You play an instrument? He tried to hide his surprise. I don't know why I didn't know that. Somehow I've always missed hearing you exhibit. Samuel didn't like me performing for anyone but him, she said tightly. Did he never even tell you I played? No, actually. Another thing that surprised him. I suppose you play the pianoforte? I do, but my instrument of choice this evening is the harp lute. I also play the regular harp and the harpsichord. Let me guess, he said. You picked those three because your maiden name is Harper. <laughs> My maiden name would have to be Harpist for that to work, she teased him, technically. Tess laughed, but he only stared at Eliza in bemusement. She had never teased him before. It gave him pause. 
You must be very talented, his sister said, and not just in musical instruments. My brother has told me so much about you and your sisters and elegant occasions. Despite being stained with scandal as the children of a divorced Marquis and his adulterous wife, the Harper sisters had created a business that had become the most sought-after aid to throwing a successful social event. That was evidenced by the fact that tonight's musicale was being held in a Marquis's mansion. Should I be flattered or insulted by what your brother told you of me? Eliza asked his sister. Tess chuckled. <laughs> oh, flattered, to be sure. Nat has said nothing but good things. Nat? Eliza turned her sparkling gaze on him. Even Samuel never called you anything but Nathaniel. He groaned. Sadly, my family has used Nat most of my life. I can't break them of the habit. We called him Natty when he was little, Tess said confidentially, clearly ignoring the glower he leveled on her until he threatened to run away from home if we didn't stop. She smirked at him. He was domineering even then. I'm not domineering, he drawled. It's not domineering when one way is the only correct way. Eliza laughed. You sound like my new brother-in-law. He sounds like me, you mean. You're younger than he is, aren't you? Eliza asked. He arched an eyebrow. Are you pretending to know my age, madam? <laughs> I know your age exactly. You're 31. You and Sammy were both started at Eton at the same age. Oh, so he told me. Close enough. I was actually a year younger than Sam. But he did speak the truth about us starting at Eton together. He frowned. Although he knew I was a year younger, can't imagine why he would tell you otherwise. In case you didn't notice, Eliza said dryly, my late husband could be rather vain. He often pretended to be younger than he was. That doesn't surprise me. He paused, not wanting to talk about Sam. There was too much he'd have to conceal. I just turned thirty. She steadied a curious gaze on him. How old do you think I am? <laughs> Good God, I wouldn't be foolish enough to guess, he said, ignoring his sister's sceptical glance. I know you're the oldest of your sisters, but definitely much younger than I. I'm 27, old enough to know you're flattering me. And why is that, I wonder? At that moment, as the silence stretched between them, his other companion for the evening entered the foyer, looking worried as she approached Tess. My lady, I searched everywhere in the coach, as did one of the footmen, and neither of us could find your shawl. Perhaps you left it at home? Before Nathaniel could reassure her, Tess said kindly, No doubt. Don't you worry one moment about it. Eliza, may I present Mrs. Jocelyn March, Nathaniel said. She's staying with me and my sister at Foxstead Place for the season. Jocelyn blushing furiously, curtsied, and Eliza, always kind, offered Jocelyn her hand. How nice to meet you, Mrs. March. The chit looked at the hand with a mix of embarrassment and intimidation before she took it. Nathaniel sighed. He was going to have to remind Jocelyn once more that she belonged in society, even if she didn't feel as if she did, even if there were difficulties. Why don't you and Jocelyn go find seats, Nathaniel told Tess. There's a matter I wish to discuss with Eliza. With a nod, Tess took Jocelyn off with her, since he'd already told his sister what he needed to talk to Eliza about. As soon as they were gone, Eliza stared after them, then lowered her voice. Forgive me, but you must not be aware I'm in charge of this musicale. Can't whatever you want to discuss with me wait until it's over? He chuckled. I'm certain you already have everything in readiness. Surely you can spare five minutes for your husband's oldest and dearest friend? She eyed him askance. Five minutes? 
Or thereabouts. We can't stay afterward, because we must rush home to relieve the poor maid looking after Jocelyn's two-year-old son. As a bachelor, I didn't exactly have the uh, proper staff to handle a child. I can only imagine. Her lips twitched. I'm sure her husband isn't up to the task either. Uh, forgive me, I forgot to mention she's a widow like you. Indeed, her husband served on the peninsula as well, but not in the 28th Regiment of Foot with me. I assume that Sam mentioned in his letters the man he was aide to camp for, Major General James Anson. Well, Jocelyn is Anson's daughter. Not too many details, my boy. That always gets you into trouble. Concern crossed her face. Didn't the general die in the same battle as Samuel? Nathaniel nodded. As did Jocelyn's husband. Several regiments were involved in the Battle of Talavera. I'm aware, she said, her eyes misting. I read everything I could about it. I was with the general when he died of his wounds a week after. He appointed me Jocelyn's guardian before he perished, since by then he'd been told that her husband had died in battle, leaving her nothing. Damn, he had to tread carefully here. But it wasn't as if he were lying, more like stretching the truth as far as it would go. Once she discovered she was bearing a child, everything became more complicated, as you might imagine. Oh, that poor woman, Eliza said. She seems awfully young to be dealing with so much. She's 20. She was only 16 when I met her. That's why I wanted to talk to you. I promised her father I'd make sure she found a good husband to take care of her. But I couldn't do much about it until now because of her pregnancy and her being in mourning. Then, us being in mourning. She lived with our mother and her mother died. And now she lives with Tess and Lord Usborne in Gloucestershire. But she can't do that forever. She and your sister do seem to get along, Eliza said cautiously. They do, but Linwood is too small for husband hunting. And although she's my ward until 21, she can't live with me. Obviously. She eyed him with interest. Has she no other family? Of her own, I mean. I assume that the general or her mother had some, and perhaps even her late husband. March was an orphan, so there's no family on his side. That lie came easily enough. As for the general, his parents and only family died before he joined the army, and after that, a wealthy gentleman for whom he'd done a great service purchased an officer's commission for him. He even fought in America for a time, which is how he met his wife. She was American? Yes, she died in childbirth some time ago, as did her baby. Jocelyn was their only surviving child. The part about the Ansons was all true, sadly enough. It's not even possible to take Jocelyn to live with her American relatives, given the tensions between our countries at present. Besides, once her mother married a British officer, her mother's family disowned her. The flash of sympathy crossing Eliza's face gave him hope that elegant occasions would take Jocelyn on. That makes Mrs. March's situation even more tragic. Eliza said in a soothing voice. You have no idea. I'm glad you think so, because I was hoping that perhaps if I paid you and your sisters, paid elegant occasions, you might be able to, well, find her a good husband. Exactly. It is the sort of thing you and your sisters do, isn't it? A frown furrowed her brow. Not quite. We could hardly engineer a debut for a widow with a small child, even one with her titled connections. I'm not suggesting a debut as such, but you could introduce her into certain circles, make sure that men looking for wives notice her. Because of her youth, she needs a chaperone, and I will not suffice. Tess does it at present, but she's not fond of London. So if you and your sisters could play that role for her... Someone called to Eliza from the door to the music room. She glanced around and sighed. 
I can't talk about this now. Why don't you bring Mrs. March to the townhouse tomorrow, and we'll discuss it while Verity is there. I'll see if Diana can't join us as well. Will that suit? Of course. Thank you. With a distracted smile, she hurried off. He released a ragged breath. That had gone about as well as he could have hoped. At least he'd have a chance to convince the three sisters. And he would enjoy seeing them again anyway. He'd always had a fondness for them, both before and after they'd married. Or rather, before two had married, if he included Eliza. From what he'd heard, Verity was still unattached. Slipping into the music room, he took the seat his sister had apparently saved for him. She leaned close to whisper. Well, has your Eliza agreed to help with Jocelyn's situation? She's not my Eliza by any means, but she did say she'd meet with us tomorrow to discuss the matter. Give me a couple of hours with her then, and I'll talk her into it. I'm not so sure. That one has a mind of her own. Eliza? I suppose. But I've always thought of her as mild-mannered, the sort who went along with what others said. Although, if he were honest, he'd only had that perception from Sam, who'd claimed she lacked passion, not just in bed, but everywhere. She had no temper, Sam had said, which he'd seemed to think proved she didn't care enough about anything but her precious sisters to show the least bit of enthusiasm. Now that Nathaniel considered it, it smacked a bit of jealousy on Sam's part. Of her sisters? That seemed far-fetched, didn't it? I doubt she's mild-mannered when plans go awry, Tess said. I dare say she can fight for what's needed when necessary. A woman can tell these things about another woman. She let out a breath. Anyway, should I go along tomorrow too? It might make Jocelyn less nervous. There's no reason. She's my responsibility, and in any case, you need time to yourself. It's not as if my accompany a widow to elegant occasions would be considered scandalous. Even Eliza couldn't find fault with it. If you say so. With a veiled glance at Jocelyn, who was busy untangling her shawl from the pins of her coiffure, his sister leaned closer. You like her, don't you? Jocelyn? he asked, deliberately misunderstanding her. Not Jocelyn, you dolt, Mrs. Pierce. Damn, the last thing he needed was Tess playing matchmaker. I like her well enough. She was Sam's wife, after all whom he apparently wouldn't mind swiving. Bloody hell. Being celibate for the last few years had clearly taken its toll. But that didn't matter. Until Jocelyn was settled, he could not try seducing Eliza. He mustn't. Who are you trying to convince, old boy? He stared straight ahead. I'll always regard her as a friend. His sister snorted, obviously as sceptical as his conscience. She's very pretty, and exactly the sort of woman you generally fancy. He knew better than to respond to that. They sat a moment in silence. When Tess apparently realized he didn't mean to answer, she released a breath. You might consider bringing Drosselin's boy tomorrow as well, I dare say Mrs. Pierce would enjoy his shenanigans. She seems like the type, and it might ensure her help. That wasn't a bad idea, actually. You merely don't want him left with you and the servants. Why can't we keep a nursemaid on staff? I'm willing to pay for it. That child needs an army of nursemaids, I fear. He's just rambunctious, the way all boys are at his age. Suddenly you're an expert on children, his sister asked. Before he could retort, Eliza came to the podium and introduced the first lady to perform. He stifled a sigh. Now he would have to endure varying levels of execrable performances by young ladies with little talent. Crossing his arms over his chest, he slumped in his chair. Do not embarrass me, his sister hissed. How on earth would I embarrass you? He hissed back. 
The last time we went to something like this, you fell asleep and started snoring. I have never snored in my life. I beg to differ. Tess surprised him by turning to Jocelyn. When we were in the carriage on the way to London and my brother fell asleep, did he or did he not snore? Jocelyn got that startled look of a rabbit transfixed by the sight of a human. Uh, well, it's all right, Jocelyn, I know I snore. Occasionally, he smirked at Tess. I only say otherwise to provoke my sister. The music began and he settled in. It was a bit better than he'd expected. He should have known that Eliza wouldn't put together anything ear-bleedingly bad. She and her sisters were consummate professionals, which was odd, given that ladies weren't supposed to work. They had turned that expectation on its head. Good for them. He hadn't managed to do that yet for himself, but he was certainly trying. Over the next hour, they heard a decent sonata, an accomplished harp solo, and an insipid duet. He had just turned to his sister to ask how many bloody performances were listed in the program anyway, when the voice of an angel came to his ears. Sure that he was imagining it, he turned his head to find Eliza playing the harp lute as she sang one of Cherubino's arias from The Marriage of Figaro. It astounded him. Her voice was as pure a soprano as an opera singer's, and her skill on the instrument rivaled that of any player he'd seen before. But he wondered if she knew that the part of Cherubino, particularly in this scene, was what they called in the theater a British role, meant for an actress wearing breeches rather than an actor. Hmm, Eliza in breeches. He could just picture it. He'd get to see her calves in nothing but stockings, her thighs and her rounded bottom molded in fabric instead of covered up by her gown and petticoats. Of course, she would never wear breeches in a public venue like this. Only actresses dared do such things, and even then, only in the theater. It would be beyond scandalous, and Eliza wasn't the scandalous sort, at least according to her late husband. But her expressive face as she sang and her cheeky understanding that the song was a droll commentary on how a boy became a man made him rethink everything Sam had told him. No man with ears would believe Eliza lacked passion of any kind. So perhaps she wasn't quite who Sam had made her out to be. Perhaps she was ready for a romantic entanglement. Nathaniel groaned. This would already be a difficult few months, assuming that elegant occasions took Jocelyn on. The last thing he needed to add to it was a flirtation with his best friend's widow. Still, as she finished singing and playing to triumphant applause, he felt his old rakish urges, which hadn't troubled him in some time, re-emerging. It might not have been part of his plan for the future, and it definitely wasn't wise. But one day soon, he meant to have Eliza Harper Pierce in his bed. However, he could get her there. Chapter Two As usual, Eliza was last to come down for breakfast. Morning was no friend of hers. She generally required two cups of coffee just to get dressed and out of her bedchamber but today was worse because she'd scarcely had any sleep. Last night in bed, she kept remembering how Lord Foxted had devoured her with his eyes during her performance, as if he were a wolf picking out his dinner. She wasn't used to that sort of gaze from him. Having known him since before she and Samuel had married, she'd seen him level it on plenty of other women, but despite his reputation as a rake hell of the first water, he'd never used his flirtatious skills on her. Until yesterday evening. It had thrilled her. That she hadn't expected, since she'd known full well he was only doing it to get something from her. But he'd looked good enough to dally with, even in half-dress. A tailcoat of corbeau-colored wool, a figured waistcoat of cream silk, and breeches of sage-green linen. 
Pausing outside the dining room, she collected her thoughts and prayed her lack of sleep didn't show. Diana might be the fashionist and Verity the temperamental artist, but Eliza moved behind the scenes to pay the bills, handle the various tradesmen accounts and unruffle feathers for tradesmen and clients alike. It required a methodical attention to detail and a talent for figuring out other people's motives and emotions, not to mention a calm demeanor. That was why she saved all her true feelings for her music. Apparently, so did Lord Foxstead, because the fire in his gorgeous raven eyes as she'd sung last night had ignited her in places she'd long thought dead. Now she must smooth her features into serenity and pray that the mask would hide her chaotic emotions. At least Rosie, Diana's sister-in-law, who would be filling Diana's shoes soon, was on her honeymoon trip and Diana didn't usually come over until later, so Eliza only had to deal with Verity. Adopting an air of competence and confidence, she swept into the dining room and headed straight for the sideboard. Good morning. You look fetching today, her sister said. That parrot green shade is so becoming on you. Isn't that your new walking gown? Weren't you saving it for some special affair? Eliza filled her bowl with porridge. I thought I'd try it out, see if it feels constraining when I wear it all day. Verity laughed. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with the fact that Lord Foxstead will be here shortly. Certainly not. Eliza met Verity's gaze with what she hoped was a steady look. Why should it? And how did you know he was coming anyway? He sent a note saying he'd arrive at noon. Her heart began to race. Stop that. She chided her incorrigible heart. Lord Foxstead isn't the sort of man you want, and you know it. A pity that her body wasn't listening. Meanwhile, Verity sipped her tea, dressed in her white spotted muslin and fussy morning cap, looking for all the world like a prim miss. Appearances were deceiving with that one, to be sure. Did you happen to see the phantom fellow at the music hall? Verity asked. <laughs> Is that what we're calling him these days? That's what I've been calling him, Verity said. It's an apt description, Eliza said, considering he generally disappears before any of the rest of us spot him. You caught a glimpse of him once, at that large affair in Eton. Barely. You are right about the man. He does his best not to be seen. Eliza eyed her sister closely, except by you. I just happened to notice him. Everyone else assumes he's someone they don't know. I only wish I could learn his name. Why, so you can have a little flirtation with him? <laughs> don't be silly, I've no interest in him that way. Verity sat down her teacup. Although I did hear that you and the Earl talked privately at the musical last night, and that he appeared quite enraptured by your performance later. Oh dear, so Eliza hadn't imagined it. Had he perhaps really meant it? Ridiculous. She shot Verity a dark look as she took a seat at the table. You must have good spies in that household. I have good spies everywhere, Verity said with a gleam in her green eyes. She got up to place another shirred egg on her plate. Of course, when they speculated he might have an interest in you. What nonsense. She only wished it wasn't. He merely wants something from me. From us. That's the only reason he paid me any heed, You'll recognize that once I reveal why he's coming here today. Because he wishes to hire us, Verity grinned, unless he's coming to propose to you. Right, she snorted. I'm exactly the sort of wife an earl needs, a widow drenched in scandal who's approaching thirty and has no dowry. You are nowhere near thirty yet, and he's a wealthy earl, so he doesn't need a dowry. Also, as Geoffrey's good friend, Foxstead may just yearn to join our cosy little family. Eliza laughed outright. 
<laughs> He's never yearned for that before, and he was Samuel's good friend long before the man proposed to me. Besides, since when does a rich man want less wealth? She busied herself with stirring her porridge. Eventually, he'll require an heir and a spare, so he'd do better to find a young virgin of unimpeachable virtue, with enough instruction from her hapless mamma to look the other way while he dallies with a mistress. I will inform him of your suggestions for his future wife. I'm sure he will appreciate the advice. Eliza snorted. How amusing you are this morning. But he isn't our prospective client, though he's paying for the one who is. She explained everything Lord Foxted had told her the previous night. Verity paused in the midst of buttering her toast. What did you think of his ward? She's a veritable babe in the woods. I can hardly believe she's as old as twenty. Still, I find it curious that her father appointed a known scapegrace like Lord Foxstead as her guardian. Since Mrs. March was his commander's daughter, with no friends or family in England aside from her child, Verity put down her toast. And if his lordship's own mother and sister champion her too. I know, and we could use the funds. Still, how did she end up with a two-year-old if her late husband was on the peninsula? Verity shrugged. Perhaps Mr. March was on leave for some reason. Why, are you saying Lord Foxstead is the boy's father? It's possible, isn't it? I remember the exact date when Lord Foxstead returned from the war and visited me to inform me of Samuel's death two and a half years ago. Isn't it possible that his next visit was to the young widow March to tell her of the death of her husband? And perhaps he found a widow who wasn't grieving all that much. It would be easy enough to fudge the child's age a few months, either way, to cover up the Earl's involvement. You're forgetting that Mrs. March might have been with her husband on the peninsula. The army doesn't send women to war, Verity. Not yet, anyway. Don't they? Who nurses the wounded and washes all the men's uniforms? Verity refilled her teacup. I hardly think the men do it. You never hear about a washerman, after all. And, male chefs notwithstanding, I doubt army cooks are as good at making scarce provisions palatable as a wife would be. Eliza frowned as Verity's supposition hit home. Samuel had told her that officers were never allowed to bring their wives with them. Then again, she had long ago lost faith in Samuel's slippery grip on the truth. Is she pretty? Verity asked. Lord Foxstead likes them pretty, from what I've heard. She's the sort of shy waif any lord would fancy as his wife, all bouncing black curls and impossibly long lashes and demure green eyes. Not to mention that unlike Verity, who was slender, and Eliza, whose curves could be a bit too ample, Jocelyn March had the perfect figure somewhere in the middle. Oh, Eliza added, and he calls her by her Christian name. Geoffrey calls me by my Christian name, but that doesn't mean I'm his mistress. I should hope not. Our sister would box his ears if our brother-in-law even considered it. Besides, he seems madly in love with her. True, Verity waved her butter knife at Eliza in a very unmannerly fashion. In their youth, their governess had tried unsuccessfully to rid her of the gesture. So, did this young woman friend of Lord Foxstead's call him by his Christian name? Nathaniel. Such a nice name. Mm, I don't think so. I can't remember. But you know how he is. He tries to seduce every attractive female he meets. Verity arched her eyebrows high. Is that what he did once he had you alone at the music hall? Don't be absurd. He hardly had time to do that, she said defensively. More's the pity. Deciding to parry gossip with more gossip, she said, Should I believe Geoffrey when he said Lord Fox had made advances to you and Diana and even Rosie last year during the season? Advances? Verity laughed. <laughs> because he danced with all of us? That's ridiculous. 
Consider the source, for goodness sake. Geoffrey didn't want any man looking at his future wife, or dallying with his sister, so he tried to make Lord Foxstead out to be some fiendish fellow on the prowl. When I first knew him before I married, he was precisely that. Even after I married, he was known for his dalliances. Are you saying he made no advances to you? That you have no interest in him whatsoever? Why did she feel compelled to find that out? Why should she care if Verity was setting her cap for Lord Foxstead? Don't be absurd, although I will concede he's rather stunning, even better looking than your late husband, who'd been quite the handsomest man Eliza had ever met, until he'd introduced her to his friend. She tamped down a feeling of disloyalty. With the Earl's tightest cropped black hair, striking features, and devil-may-care smile, 